to another chance to be uh, aware and alert, God, and to be stretched and confirmed, challenged, um, just to be in your word. Uh, would you speak to us, God, as we take this uh, next 20 minutes or so just to be um, receiving, God, and receiving seeds of truth that we would bear much fruit. Uh, would you speak, Lord, through me? I thank you and I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, guys, I hope you had a wonderful week and a happy Sunday or whenever you're listening. Um, I've entitled this word, Where You Go, I Will Go, as you can see. And the, the word comes from Mark chapter 12, 28 through 34. So uh, I'll read it for us if you'd follow along. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given him a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him to love him with all your heart with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. All right, so the key thought is very simple. It's a, just a restating of the main commandment. Let us love the Lord with all that we are, all the time, and follow him wherever he leads us. And the key verse comes from 1 John 3.18. Dear children, let us not love in words or in speech, but with action and in truth. Um, well, the key point is really clear, to love God and to love our neighbors with the love of God. I really like uh, 1 John 3.18 because it not only says, hey, you know, it's not just about talk, but 
acting, but not only just acting, but in truth. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of social justice movements and what the definition of love, what the definition of good is. Um, but it's important that we love others according to God's will, according to His ways, uh, so that we don't get burnt out or we get prideful and thinking, oh yeah, I show so much love, I'm so loving. It's you know, it's more about, man, like, why do we love and how is it that we love? Because we're first loved by God. Um, and from that position of humility to love and to leave everything else in God's hand. Well, if I were to end the sermon there, that would be truly a lot <clears throat> to love God with all that we are. Man, but what does it mean? Um, and so uh, I really like having an example to look at and to really, you know, draw truths from. So we got something from Ruth this week, and we have a, an example of both someone who really doesn't love God with all that they are, and we have uh, Ruth who loves God with all that she is. Um, so I'm going to read us Ruth, Ruth chapter 1, uh, 1 through 18, so you can follow along. Again, that's Ruth 1, 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived about ten years, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. When Naomi, uh, Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to, I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons. Would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No. My daughters, it is, is it, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Wow. Well, a little bit of background on uh, who the Moabites were. Um, we're going to take a story way back to Abraham. Uh, God calls him. Uh, out of the land of Ur and says, hey, you know, I'm going to make a people out of you, but I need you to leave your people first, your whole family. And so in obedience, uh, Abraham takes off, but he grabs his nephew a lot. Fast forward when they're both filthy rich and the land cannot support their animals. And so Abraham says, look, instead of our people fighting, uh, you choose left or right. If you, whatever decision you make, I'm going to go in the opposite decision. So you, you have first dibs. Of course, Lot looks up and he sees this, this beautiful, green, great looking land. So he goes that way. Abraham goes the opposite. And of course, that ends up being Sodom and Gomorrah, where a lot of other people thought, well, wow, what a beautiful place to live. And so uh, Lot ends up in Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, okay, the people there are beyond redemption. Like, this is crazy. I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah takes a lot of encouraging, but Lot finally gets out of there with his family. Wife turns to a pillar of salt. She looks back, even though God said, do not. And Lot and his two daughters end up in a cave in the mountains. Um, and so what happens is, you know, they grew up in Sodom and Gomorrah. So all they know how to do is sin. All they know how to do is trust themselves. So 
Lot's daughters decide, you know what, let's take the matter into our own hands. And um, uh, they, they basically get their father drunk and, um, you know, uh, spend the night with him and bear children uh, out of incest. The older daughter's son is Moab, and from his lineage come the Moabites. Um, they were not a people of God. Uh, they were, and, and so uh, fast forward to when the Israelites, after they exit Egypt and they, after wandering in the Promised Land, they're posted up next to Israel. Um, and the, the, so if my hand was Israel, Moab's about right here. Uh, just along the bottom, Dead Sea right here, Moab just kind of in that area. So the Israelites are posted up next to, between the land of Moab and the Promised Land, which is to be, you know, future Israel. And so the Moabites see them, they're like, you know, hundreds of thousands of them. They're all, you know, they're all over the place and they can see them. They have like a vantage point or something. And so the king of Moab says, all right, you know what? These people are going to overtake us. They can become a threat to us. There's so many of them. They're going to take up all the resources. So let's make sure they get ruined. And he tries to get a prophet of God to curse the people of Israel. Um, yeah, like good luck with that. So God obviously doesn't curse them. In fact, he, in fact, he blesses them. But the story goes on. Um, the king of Moab finally, through this, this, this prophet, uh, so-called, uh, finds a way to kind of poison Israel by sending in Moabite women to sleep with the men of Israel to draw them away from God. So in a sense, he's successful. Um, and so it's just evil, you know, just really against God. And so God's like, you know what, don't even intermarry with them. Not because of, you know, God isn't racist, but it's because the Moabite people would lead them astray. And so it was a lesson, a principle. And so, you know, Israel and Moabite, though they were neighbors, one was distinctly of God and the other's not. In the same vein, we have two contrasting characters, um, one who is and one who, who is not loving God. And that's Elimelech and Naomi. Uh, they each respond to hardship and life differently. For Elimelech, who's uh, you know born and bred Israelite, when things get hard, he chooses to turn his back on God and you know decide to use his own intuition, his own... Um, thinking. It says, you know, like Israel's under a famine right now. Things are getting hard, economic downturn. You know, my stocks are going down. So I'm going to hightail out of here and go to a neighboring country. It's just, you know, cross the border and I'm there and they're doing fine. So he, he goes over there, godless region. Um, so, you know, uh, basically his heritage and his God becomes inconvenient, turns around. For Ruth, it's the opposite. Uh, when things are really bad, she has no husband, no future, no promise of anything. And she actually leaves behind her Moabite um, opportunities where she could go home and most definitely find a new husband and have a life. She turns her back to that in hardship and in fact chooses to love her mother-in-law, Naomi, even if it hurts her, uh, e even though a guarantee of life of poverty is what is set before her. Amazing. Um, and so that, that's, that's the, the, the critical difference between the two. And so let's take a closer look at Elimelech. We basically have this idea or this image of self-love versus God love. This man, he's all about himself. I don't know if it was his own decision or maybe Naomi was like, Hey, husband, like what's, what's going on here? We, you have to do something, make a decision or the head of the, I don't know. Or maybe he was just like, you know what? I'm going to take things into my own hands and he just, you know, moves his family but, you know, he decides to run away. And uh, isn't it true that a lot of us do that? I, I definitely um, struggle at times. And when things get hard, instead of running to God, I run away. I look for my own escape. And instead of praying and leaving it into the hands of God, I'll worry or distract myself, be on YouTube or playing games or um, just, you know, finding, going back to old habits instead of saying, God, help me. And Elimelech does that same thing where, you know, some people like to just take things into their own hands and say, God, forget you for a second. I got this. Um, but to really the first commandment to love God with all that we are also means to love him all the time through thick and thin, especially when things get hard. That's when really your character shows. Do we really trust and love God? And another point is that, you know, in Matthew, it says that there will be a time when Christians will be hated. Jesus says very clearly, if they hated the master, of course, why wouldn't they hate the servant, which is you and I? 
So when things in America, especially if it's not already here, which it definitely is, the moment you stand up for truth, the moment you speak out the truth of God, and you're not ashamed to do it, will you be liked? Absolutely not. Um, and so we need to wake up people. Like when things get hard to be a Christian, like if, if you get your scholarship taken away, if you get that job opportunity taken away, if you lose, lose friends and lose likes on social media and followers, are you still going to stand up as a Christian? Or will it become an inconvenience and a, and a detriment to you so you turn around and you ditch God? Where were your true colors? show is the question or will you be like a Ruth who says you know what I don't care about anything my promise is to my God um, and to to show love to this mother-in-law whom I pledged you know my my bloodlines with um, even if it's self-sacrificing and the word reminds us in Matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom of, of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you Proverbs 3 5 through 6 Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will make your path straight. These are the promises that we are to live by, uh, no matter what the circumstances say. And I know it's hard, um, but if we can't do that right now, then when things get worse, how much you know? do you think we're, we're magically going to wake up one day and just be like, great, I can put everything down on the line? No, we got to start living that way right now. And Satan has had the same tactic from day one. In the garden, you know, eat the, this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Basically, it's saying, hey, you know what? You're going to have knowledge so that you can make your own decisions. Forget God. You're God. Do what you want. Trust in yourself, not God. And that's what he's still doing to us today. When hardship comes or an opportunity comes to ditch God's way and to find your own way, what will we do? Let's shift gears and talk about Ruth. Truly, um, she shows us another principle that, sh that gives us depth into the first commandment, to love God with all of, our, all of who we are and all of our understanding means this, to love God is to hate everything else. To love God is to hate everything else. Now, that doesn't mean like literally go out and hate people or hate your parents. It means that you're so in love with God that anything that dare come and, and threaten or compromise or negate or try to um, you know, censor or change or derail your love and your, and, your, and your commitment to God you hate. You will not let that happen. Um, also, anything else besides God just pales in comparison to the love that you have for God. I can imagine Ruth as, as she's in this position where Naomi's like, okay, I'm going back to my land now. Uh, now that there's food there, I'm going back. And Ruth... The one thing that she does is, again, she contrasts from Naomi. Naomi's like, oh, there's food here, I'm going. There's food there, I'm going. Ruth is like, okay, you know what? I made my decision. I'm, I'm, I'm going where you go. Um, and, and the crazy thing is, I'm sure back at home in, in Moab, uh, Ruth's parents are probably like, no, dude, come back home. Just like Orpah did. We'll find you a new husband. You're going to go in Kozen. You're going to suffer. Why would you go back to Israel to live as a foreigner, as a widow? You're so dumb. Like, come home. And when Ruth probably told her parents, like, no, I'm not coming back home. I'm not going to just change my uh, course because it, things got hard. Um, and she probably, you know, had to break ties with her own family again. Um, and they probably, like, man, you must hate us, huh? You're just like ditching us on the side of the road so you can go follow that mother-in-law of yours who can provide you nothing. Um, and yet her love for God and her commitment to God is so real. And that's the thing, when back in the day when uh, a foreigner were to marry a Jew, in order to do that, they would have to get baptized. So Christianity actually borrows baptism from Judaism. And so they would use this, this practice to proselytize pagans or non-believers into Judaism by saying you're going to renounce your entire identity, your heritage, your who you are, customs, family, everything, cut ties, and now you are a Jew by your baptism. You will only serve uh, the God of Israel and live as a Jew for the rest of your life. So she did that when she married um, her Jewish husband. And when things got hard, she decided, you know what, my God, the, the God that I've been serving Israel will continue to be my God. Naomi, my mother-in-law, I'm still going to follow you. And that is the resolve that she has, um, which is so inspirational, so amazing, something that we can learn from. And she really um, uh, shows us how much uh, 
you know, how hard it is, and yet a great example of how to love God all the time. And she also demonstrates the second command by loving Naomi, her mother-in-law, even more than herself. And, you know, God, the second command, love your neighbor as yourself. Man, she put herself down and sacrifices her future so that she can love Naomi, not just ditch her to go live alone as a widow. Because Naomi's old. Ruth, at least she's young. Who knows what could happen? At least she can go out and, and work a little in the fields as widows do. And I do encourage you to read the rest of uh, Ruth. Um, but she certainly does not love just in word and speech, but in, in deed and in truth, in action and in truth. The next point I want to talk about is, uh, you know, what does God put an emphasis on? In the story, we have another uh, very important contrast. Elimelech, he's basically a born and bred uh, Jew of Jews. You know, he's an Ephrathite. He is a Hebrew from the tribe of Beth, uh, from the city of Bethlehem in the tribe of Judah. So one of the, you know, bigger, more prominent tribes because Judah basically was the leader because Reuben slept with his dad's um, wife. And so Reuben kind of lost that, uh, the leadership uh, of the family, though he was first born. So Judah had this prominence and so he's from this great tribe, and yet when push comes to shove, when things get hard, his heritage showed nothing. He literally ditched God and went to live in the enemy territory. And Ruth, her background is, I come from a lineage of incest, from a godless culture. And yet when she decides, makes a decision to trust in God, she stays on it. So the things that people tend to put emphasis in this world, like <clears throat> where are you from? What's your family like? What have you done in your life? Like what kind of degree do you, how much money do you make? What kind of car do you drive? House that you live in? You know, how good looking are you? How well put together? God doesn't care about any of those things. One thing he cares about is your heart and your ability to commit um, and to stay on that, stay true to that commitment. And Ruth really shows us that. She, she humbles Elimelech's life with her decision, um, <clears throat> even though he was like this perfect, you know, like um, poster boy Jew, uh, uh, Ruth really uh, puts in the shame with the, with the decisions that she made. May we be like that. Um, <clears throat> and I want to end, end with this, which is a, rede a redefinition and an application. Um, you know, we live in a country where everything is about big, big, big. In America, it's all about, you know, the, the bottom line, uh, the big dream about doing big things, you know, like how much are you going to make from this project? Like, how, how are you going to retire? Like, if, if you do this huge project, what's going to be the profit margin? Um, <clears throat> think big, you know, global. And it's all about the individual and, you know, big college, get that big house. And, you know, have a big, happy family and a big dream. And it doesn't really focus on <clears throat> the small things. But in Jewish culture, you know, what they had them do back in the day was attach a little a box to their clothing and on the doorpost and have the word of God written in it. So how many times in the day would you actually be reminded of the word of God? Literally all the time, right? So it really teaches us that when we love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, I think as Americans, we tend to think about, okay, so what am I going to do? Am I going to start like this big church? Or like, am I going to go to Africa and save the entire continent? Or, you know, oh, I'm going to become a, I'm a doctor and then I'm going to go on medical missions. Or, and those are great things. But then in the small little things of our lives, there's no focus. There's no commitment. And the way the Jews are taught to, to serve God is in every little thing that you do. That is where the all comes in all the time um, and all that you do to, to, to trust him, to acknowledge him, to lean upon him and thereby love him. And, and that is the redefining that I want to do is the small, what seems to be insignificant. Um, and it, so because we live in this culture of big and, and great, um, that we need to just change all of that and think about the small, the little things. And that's where the battle is. Um, and, and, and that's another theme in the story. Like <clears throat> Elimelech, he just went from uh, Israel to a neighboring country. He literally stepped across the border and he's in Moab. What's the big deal, right? But you know, how, how much of a distance is there from your bed to the ground next to your bed? what two feet but how hard is it to get out of your comfortable warm bed in the morning and to get on your knees and to pray 
and to pray for your friends, pray for your parents, pray for your teachers and, and that kid at school who's struggling with drugs or, um, you know, like struggling with thoughts of depression and suicidal ideation, all these things that people struggle. How many times are we in compassion praying for others and, and committing ourselves to that kind of thing, for example, or during the week, how much time do you make out every day to read the word, to study it, um, and to engage in fellowship and to, and to obey God in the little tiny things. Um, that's my challenge to everyone, to myself, uh, to love God in all that we do and, all, and with all that we are with the little things all the time and see how God teaches us and grows in us this muscle of faith that begins to uh, you know, grow and strengthen and allow us to do the bigger things that God has in store for us later. Uh, but truly, where you go, I will go. May we follow God, trust Him, and really love Him with every decision that we make. Um, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for God, for first loving us and um, for not worrying about the things that the world cares about or other people, but really you look at our hearts. Father, would you change us to be able to make decisions and commit to them, to be disciples of Christ, to not turn back, to not put a hand on the plow and to look back, not to be like Lot's wife and look back and look at what's happening to others, whether they're profiting or being destroyed, but to keep our eyes on you alone, Father. And help us to exercise this muscle of faith all the time, developing, developing it each day in the smaller battles. Even though these, these, short, these short destinations from the bed to the ground, just to pray. Father, help us to do that, Father, and to, be, to live like Ruth did, Father, trusting you. For we know what happened to her. She became the great-grandmother of the greatest king in the history of Israel. And I'm sure she didn't know that, but God, you have great things planned. You can do great things out of our tiny little actions, our little mustard seed faith, Father. Uh, Lord, would you begin to work in the youth? Would you work in the next generation so that while they're young, they learn to trust you with all of their hearts and they'll love you. We thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, guys. Well, thanks for tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful week, a victorious week in the little things. God bless, and I'll catch you next week. Bye-bye.